Hey, it's me, Jen again, and today we'll learn all about how to manage thyroid cysts without surgery. We'll be joined again by Dr. Augustine Andrade after this. For many years, the standard of care for managing thyroid cysts was surgery. But did you know that there is an inexpensive and effective alternative treatment option that preserves the thyroid gland? We're going to talk today about PEI, percutaneous ethanol injection, and some people call it EA. This is a procedure I actually have a tiny bit of experience with myself, I, not mm. on my thyroid. I had a cyst on my kidney was actually the size of a baseball. Wow. Yeah. And I had it treated almost a year ago and it completely disappeared. It's super successful. Yeah. It is something that part of the talking today is that we need to emphasize the importance of this and more people need to be trained because really it changes the, the patient perspective of the treatment. Let me start saying that about 60% uh, of everybody during the lifetime is going to have thyroid nodules and about a good 20 to 30 percent of all the nodules are going to be cystic or partially cystic. The treatment of these cystic lesions are done when the patient is symptomatic, meaning the patient has pressure or changes in the voice or problems to swallow. So far, the only treatment or the most frequent treatment in the United States is surgery. Remove half of the thyroid at least. And if you have two cysts, that, that implies removal of the whole thyroid. The alcohol injection is divided in two steps. When you have a simple cyst, you just remove the fluid, then you repeat the ultrasound in three months. The problem with that procedure is that in 70% of the cases, the cyst recurs. When you have a thyroid cyst that is rather complex, meaning that it's cystic and solid, we recommend to do a biopsy of the solid component at the same time that we remove the fluid and we send for cytology. Mm -hmm. uh, even though the cancer in complex lesions is very rare, it is good to have a cytologist to be sure that the nodule is benign. So we see the patient three months after this biopsy. And as I said, in 70%, 80% of the cases, the cyst comes back again. Mm -hmm. And at that time, what we do is remove the fluid and we put the alcohol. We put more or less um, a 30 to 50% of the amount of alcohol that we remove, no more than five cc's total of alcohol. And the, there's two possibilities. Either we dwell the alcohol for about uh, five to nine minutes, or many times we just leave the alcohol there, we remove the needle, and that's the end of the procedure. So the whole procedure takes um, about 10 minutes. Wow. Um, times less. It's not painful. You rarely have pain from the alcohol. And you have pain because the alcohol is spilled out of the cyst and can give you some pain in the subcapsular area. But mm -hmm. that's rare. Patients that have pain, and usually the pain is for less than the one day. Wow. When you inject that alcohol inside the cyst, tell me a little bit about what's happening inside the cyst with the alcohol. When you put the alcohol in this cavity, it causes inflammation in the inner part of the, of the nodule. This inflammation causes necrosis of the interior lining of, of, of the cyst. And once you have the necrosis, then you stop making more fluid and it collapses and causes fibrosis. That's a really much more effective way to manage a cyst. Aren't cysts nearly always benign? Yeah, so the chances of a cyst mm -hmm. to be cancer is less than 1%. So you're dealing with the problem instead of removing the entire thyroid lobe or even both sides, if, as you said, if it's on both sides and allowing that patient to continue having their functioning thyroid. That is correct. And moreover, the, the patient finishes the procedure and she can go and play tennis in, within one hour. There, oh there's, no, there's no pain whatsoever. Wow. How long have you been doing this procedure? Not for a long time, only for 23 years. That's not very long at all. 
Oh my yeah, goodness. I, I've you, been doing this for years. Got uh, a lot of experience with that then. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And a lot of frustration because uh, many of the academic institutions, they don't teach the, the fellows and the students how to do this. So when they get out of the fellowship, the only thing that they have in their mind is the removal of the cyst. And if that doesn't work to pursue surgery. Let's talk a little bit about the similarities and the differences between this procedure and thyroid RFA, because they both are ablative procedures, but there are a few differences. The studies done on these two procedures uh, were done in a cohort of 50 patients. And the, it showed that the radio frequency ablation have a total volume reduction of the nodule of about 80 to 89% and the ethanol injection had an 82% of reduction of the volume. So how effective the two procedures are, are completely similar. There is also studies of 110 patients that they did um, a, a percutaneous laser ablation in cysts. The volume reduction is about 80, 82%. So it is very similar. The only difference is that the percutaneous laser ablation had more pain than the radio frequency ablation after the end of the procedure. Is this procedure better for cysts or for complex nodules or for solid nodules? So the indication is for cysts and partially cystic lesions that have cysts more than 50% of the entire nodule. So if you have a nodule that is more than 50% solid, we do not recommend that. This is more than 50% cystic then you can pursue with the alcohol injections. And remember the two steps, when you have a complex nodule, solid and cystic, you first do the biopsy, be sure that everything is fine, even though, as you said, uh, when you have a cyst, uh, it's very seldom that you have a malignancy. So in a case where you have a nodule that is partially cystic and it's more solid, you would recommend RFA for that nodule? Absolutely. In that case, RFA is the way to go. Mm -hmm. So what we do is that we remove the fluid. Once the fluid is out, then we burn the nodule with the radio frequency ablation. The only exception is if you have a, a cyst that is tiny, tiny, that doesn't bother me, then we don't remove that. We just go ahead and, and do the ablation of the, of the solid component. Is there ever a case where you would maybe do a combination approach with RFA and yes. EI together? Yes. Yes, I do that quite frequently. Mm -hmm. um, uh, when I see that it, it, there is a, a nodule that have a lot of fluid component, like a, a month or two months prior to the procedure, I put alcohol and then I tell the patient to come back in a month later for the radio frequency ablation. You mentioned to me a, a name of a procedure called the San Gennaro procedure. Tell me about what, what that is used for and how it works. This is when the, the cyst is very viscous, very thick, mm -hmm. and you cannot remove it with a needle. So when the cyst is very thick, we use an 18 gauge needle to remove. And when you cannot remove with an 18 gauge, then what we do is we put alcohol into the cyst and uh, we wait a week. And in a week, we remove the fluid. So it liquefies and make the cyst less viscous. So we're able to remove it. Would you believe me that very few people in the United States knows about this procedure? And so when they cannot remove it, they say, well, we try surgery. Mm -hmm. and then, so the San Gennaro procedure, of course, it was, as the name says, it's coming from Italy. So it's, there's a saint in Napoli, that is San Gennaro, is the saint of the city. Mm -hmm. And once a year, the blood of San Gennaro liquefy. And that's where the procedure is called San Gennaro. Oh my goodness. What an interesting historical reference. That's really yeah. cool. I've never heard of that procedure before. Yeah, so that is the San Gennaro. That is important to the audience that the doctor cannot remove the cyst because it's too thick, not to say surgery, that they still, mm -hmm. there is a, they can do the San Gennaro and remove the fluid without surgery mm -hmm. and put in alcohol. Once I remove the fluid a week later, I put the alcohol again. Mm -hmm. Before I really started talking about RFA, like I do, <laughs> I've heard a lot of stories of patients who had very large cysts, just having surgery and, and it just seemed very much like. It's over overly corrected. I would say that yes. because the, the surgery is not necessary. 
Yes, yes. And and the fact that if their thyroid is perfectly functional, it just seems so sad to, to lose the thyroid over a cyst because a cyst is really not anything but a structural problem. It's some and, causing and hormonal a, issues. Absolutely. And as a yeah. doctor, I feel so frustrated mm -hmm. that uh, they don't teach in the university this procedure. Let's talk about cost. Okay. So the surgery costs $20,000, more or less. Radiofrequency ablation costs $6,000. And the alcohol cost eight hundred dollars oh my goodness yes why is this not more common <laughs> now you understand why they don't want to do the alcohol yeah it's not as lucrative i guess that's why it's so important your program because mm -hmm. the artists need to know the doctors they don't tell that to the patients in my experience personally the only way I knew to look for this was by looking online and reading about it. It was not ever offered to me in my local physician's office. I ended up having my kidney treated at the University of Virginia because I was able to have that done with the same provider who treated my thyroid with RFA. As you said, it's, it's very frustrating. It sounds like it's a simple approach, a simple procedure. Is there a learning curve for learning how to do this? I mean, to teach this is very simple. It's like a fine needle aspiration of the thyroid. You need to have perfect control of the needle. Be sure that you're seeing mm -hmm. where you put the needle, you aspirate it, you put the alcohol, and uh, you see that the alcohol is getting into the nodule. You don't want to have the needle outside of the cyst because then that is going to spill out of the thyroid and that is going to be very painful. But going back to your question, it's, it's very easy to learn about the procedure. And again, the frustration is that university doesn't teach because nobody can teach it because nobody does it. So it's a vicious cycle. We need to be talking about this just as much as the other non-surgical options because if this is a less expensive, easily but, but, done procedure, then there's no reason why it shouldn't be more prevalent than it is. Because the biggest barrier for RFA is the cost. So in United States, there, there's only one publication done by Mayo Clinic uh, two years ago. It was published in the, your own journal. When I tried to present all the data with American patients, into the major thyroid journal, they decline it. They say that it's not interest. Well, what about overseas? Is there a lot of data? Oh, overseas, overseas they're doing this. So they, the Italians have been doing this for 25 years, more, I'm sorry, but 30 years. In Europe, the alcohol injection is the first treatment of choice for cystic lesions before you even think about radiofrequency ablation or worse about surgery. My goodness, why, why are we so behind? <laughs> Well, once the patient has this done, you said that they could be out playing tennis an hour later. So is there yes. any recovery process whatsoever after the, the, a PEI? So Jennifer, there is no pain whatsoever. Mm -hmm. So you just remove the fluid, they put the alcohol mm -hmm. and the patient have no, I mean, they may have a little burning for a few minute, minutes, but that's about it. That there is mm -hmm. no pain like uh, you, you probably are thinking about the radiofrequency ablation or the laser. No, this is zero pain. Wow. So there's not any need for them to have any downtime or any no. uh, anti-inflammatory. There's no medicine. downtime. What about their results? When will they notice their results after a PEI procedure? When you put the alcohol injections, the, the injections, sometimes there is a, a little swelling for about three weeks. And then after that, you see all the reduction of the nodule. So you see the results in about two months after the procedure. At that time, would they return for follow-up ultrasound? I usually have the patient come back around three months after the procedure. I always warn the patient that you, they're going to have the swelling for a bit, at least a week or two mm -hmm. after the procedure. And then it, it, you, they see that everything starts shrinking. And will you see any traces of that cyst remaining on ultrasound or will it just completely disappear? No, there's traces. So when we measure how successful is the treatment, we measure in the 50% volume reduction. And most of the patient, they have a reduction of uh, 70 uh, 80%, 80% or more have a 50% volume reduction, sufficient for the patient. So they don't have any complaint 
cosmetically speaking or pressure or with the voice and etc when you do the ultrasound you still can see some little fluid but it's irrelevant is it ever necessary to repeat this procedure if you have a, a troublesome in, in my studies there's uh from about 30 patients i had to repeat it in three patients about 30 patients i had three patients that fail to the mm -hmm. treatment do you know why that is yes when the cyst is chronic, you can have fibrosis around the lining of the cyst. So the alcohol cannot create inflammation mm -hmm. and the necrosis because of the fibrosis. Mm -hmm. It's like a, a shield. And uh, when that happened, then the alcohol goes in, out, and didn't do the job. Mm -hmm. So that is rare. I think every person I know of who's had PEI, including myself, have had excellent results. And as I said at the beginning, my kidney cyst was completely undetectable on ultrasound afterwards. That's a typical scenario. In those cases that they fell to the alcohol, mm -hmm. that's when you can do the radiofrequency ablation or the laser. Well, that's good because then you have options. You're not having to worry about doing something so extreme as surgery. You have kind of a step-by-step -step process where you would first try the aspiration, which as you said, they always refill. And then you would try the PEI. And then if that failed, you would try RFA. And then if for some reason that didn't work, then there's always surgery at the end. But surgery now these days almost never happen unless there is a malignancy. Wow. So none of my patients with a cyst have required surgery ever. That's, that's fantastic. We touched on this a moment ago, the risks or side effects of this as an RFA, where you have to be very careful about the danger triangle. Is that something you have to be concerned about during PEI? No, we're talking about a big cyst that could be part of the danger triangle. That is the, the, the location that we have to be observing more carefully. When you have a big cyst and you're far away from the triangle, you're not touching that area. On my cases, nobody had voice change. Nobody have a hematoma. I, nobody had any pain that lasted for more than one day. It had been described in the literature that there's people that the alcohol is spilled outside of the cyst. When they give too much alcohol, for example, that, that may happen, but I never have those problems. So if that spill goes into the vocal cord, when you're treating cancer, that, that's, a, that's a different subject. When you put alcohol in the lymph node that is close to the recurrent nerve, you can have voice change. But when you're putting the needle in the thyroid, you shouldn't have any complication. Because the cysts are typically inside within, of the thyroid. Within the thyroid. As a patient, a lot of the times, I think we consider cysts and nodules really to be more like something attached on the outside. But I think that that's very uncommon, correct? That almost never happens. When this attach outside, something is going on. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is not the normal story. It's always inside of the thyroid. That's adding an extra layer of protection for any of those vital structures outside the thyroid, correct? That is 100% correct. What about contraindications? Are there any times where PEI is just absolutely a terrible idea? When the patient is taking medication for coagulation, and mm -hmm. then you cannot put a needle in. I uh, personally avoid, this is not a, a contraindication that everybody will agree with me, but I try not to do this in pregnant patients. And not because there is a study that has shown any complications or nothing, but when pregnant patients, the, the thyroid is super vascular. So if you put a needle, there is a hypothetical possibility that is you're going to have more bleeding mm -hmm. than normally. I think it's always good to just be extra careful with pregnant women. Anyway. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. You talked about how the frustration, you have such frustration that this isn't being taught. Are you actually training any physicians in how to do this technique? Yeah, I have the Mount Sinai, the residents. I always teach them how to do the procedure and how to manage uh, the patient after the alcohol injection. So yes, but that's uh, only in my hospital. In my hospital in Mount Sinai in Miami, uh, we have uh, approximately 20 residents. So they know about this, but in the United States, I... I don't have any, any way to reach them. Mm -hmm. uh, so that is part of my frustration. Sounds like it's a problem with lack of awareness primarily. 
Okay. Primarily. And, and, and the <laughs> other doctors, I mean, they, they read a lot and they see that in the journals and they, all the statements that the, the European countries, they do, they know that in Europe, I mean, alcohol is the first choice. They know that. So they, they do know they don't do it, but they know it. Well, we're going to, we're hopefully going to get more people to know about it through this video that we're making today. So I want to go back and touch on something you mentioned about lymph nodes and cancer. Are there other applications for PEI besides cysts and nodules that are highly cystic? About five to 30% of all the thyroid cancers, they may have local recurrence in the neck and the local recurrence go to the lymph nodes. So when you have a local recurrence in the lymph nodes, you can do surgery. Once you have done several surgeries, the chance of recurrence of thyroid cancer is about 40 to 70%. So you're going to have more lymph nodes and you cannot have surgery forever. Right. So before the radiofrequency ablation and before the, before the laser, the only option that we have to treat those patients was with the alcohol. So we put alcohol in the lymph nodes. We had to be sure that we do hydrodissection and uh, isolate the lymph node from vital structures. And we put alcohol and we shrunk the lymph node and it works in 60 to 70% of the cases. Now, I'm doing less of that because I had the radiofrequency ablation and then I can decrease and disappear the lymph nodes with 80% possibility, but the alcohol was very well used, but you have to be careful of the hydrodissection and the anatomy, because if this is close to the recurring nerve, the patient may have changes in the voice. I never have any voice change that have been permanent, but you can have voice change, mm -hmm. but it works very well. And it was the only treatment that we had before laser and radiofrequency ablation. This sounds like it could be an option for patients who really can't afford to do RFA for those recurring cancers. That, the doctors, they do, they do it. I mean, that is not like the alcohol injection for the cyst. Mm -hmm. I think there are more doctors that they're able uh, to do alcohol injection into the lymph node for recurrences. For example, I have a a patient last week that have a recurrence only in one lymph node that was rather small. I told the patient, we can observe or we can give you so, a little bit of alcohol and disappear the lymph node. So we just gave you the alcohol injection without complications. What I told the patient is with the alcohol is, is very likely that the lymph node is not going to grow or may disappear with a 60, 70% certainty, but it's, a, it's an option. But I, I foresee that it's going to be less and less used because with the radiofrequency ablation, you just put the needle in the nodule and you just burn the lymph nodes. It's much more convenient and efficacious, the radiofrequency ablation. But again, that's what we, we had before. I'm going back to the question. So people that doesn't have the money, I think that sooner or later, we're going to have the insurance pay for, for this. I received a letter from Aetna saying that in cases of uh, recurrent uh, thyroid cancer, they're proven that in some cases where your frequency ablation, this is a start. Let's see what happens. That's very encouraging to know that about insurance coverage, because that is a big barrier for a lot of patients is that they can't justify the fact that it's not covered by their insurance. But one of the things that I talk with them a lot about is that the majority of patients have high deductibles today on the insurance. And by the time you've met your deductible, you've, in a lot of cases, paid for an RFA procedure. So it kind of comes down to considering weighing out that cost. And then you're, you're absolutely right. I foresee that uh, within the next year or two, the, the insurance are going to start covering the radiofrequency ablation more and more. Mm -hmm. uh, right now, we have just few insurance approving uh, for cancer, but soon they're going to start approving um, for benign thyroid nodules. Do you have any ideas about the decrease in surgery that could take place by being able to offer these non-surgical procedure options. Do you see any substantial decrease in the amount of surgeries that are gonna be happening over the next 15, yeah. 20 years? So, so uh, that's a beautiful question, uh, first of all. Uh, so in the United States, more or less, they perform 150,000 thyroid surgeries per year. And 67%, more or less, of all their surgeries are for benign 
nodules. And the rest of the surgeries are for grave disease that they need to do it in, in occasions, and the rest is for cancer. If we make the numbers 150,000, 60%, let's say the half is 80,000 surgeries, uh, and you multiply by $20,000, $30,000, uh, the, the average, and multiply that is billions of dollars that the, the, the taxpayers are expending in unnecessary surgeries. Obviously, I see that this has to come down. Uh, once the radio frequency ablation is covered by the insurance. And I hope that that's going to be the case very soon because there's so many people that are needlessly going through surgery and losing their thyroid and then having to take medication for the rest of their life. And it's a tragedy to see that happen when it could be avoided. I know it's not always avoidable, but when it is avoidable, it's, it can be life-changing. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. And, and, and the other side of the coin the, the insurance company that they only see money in, in everything that they do, they have to see that they're saving billions of dollars by authorizing radio frequency ablation for benign nodules. One thing I was kind of wondering when you mentioned earlier about the video, would it be okay if I pull that up on my screen and then have you kind of do a um, commentary? Absolutely. So that is a cyst. I just introduced the needle. And where you see that I'm going to start to aspirate the fluid and you see that the cyst is getting smaller. Mm -hmm. I can see that the cyst is changing shape. The nodule is getting smaller. Mm -hmm. And uh, I always leave a tiny amount of fluid. That's the secret. Okay. And so I can see um, the needle and where the alcohol is going to be injected. If you remove the whole fluid, then you don't know where the cyst is and you don't know where to put the alcohol. Okay. So I stop right there to remove fluid. Mm -hmm. Now what I'm doing is I'm changing the, 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 the syringe and I'm putting the syringe with alcohol. Mm -hmm. That's the alcohol. Okay. And it's turning white. Is that the, that, the sclerosis happening like in real time? Oh, that's the alcohol. Okay. That's the echogenicity of the alcohol. Okay. 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 So I just finish. I, I always try to go slowly with the alcohol. Mm -hmm. And the needle's out. And the patient is ready to go home. Oh my goodness. <laughs> wow. Was it. And Jennifer, that, that was real time. That was the time that I spent on doing the, the putting the alcohol. That was no time at all. Yes, that's <laughs> a real time. You said it doesn't hurt at all. Do you use anything at all for um, lidocaine? Lidocaine. I put lidocaine in the skin and a little bit in the capsule mm -hmm. um, of the thyroid. Mm -hmm. or what is called the pericapsular area. We need to have this like shouted from the rooftops. <laughs> the patients need to yes. be aware of this and physicians need to be doing this. And I hope that it will grow and uh, spread in prevalence, just like I hope these other options, RFA and laser will as well. And as you said, to save millions or billions of dollars in healthcare costs and save patients their thyroid. And save patient, exactly. Very important, the second one. The people that are looking at this video, to know that there is a very cheap option for cyst and uh, mostly cystic lesions. And uh, so long that the nodule is benign, which is the case in the majority of the cases, this is a very cheap, very efficacious, very rapid, without complications procedure and uh, in Europe is the first choice. And I wish in the United States, we, we can follow the steps of Europe in that regard. I agree, 100%. Dr. Andrade, I can't thank you enough for all of your expertise and insights on this today. It's been very informative and I hope that many people will watch this video and learn something today. So thank you so much. Thank you, Jennifer, <laughs> it was a pleasure. 
Thanks so much for watching. Make sure you subscribe and ring that little bell so you don't miss the next video. I have lots of exciting content coming up in the near future about RFA, PEI, laser ablation, traveling for treatment, and so much more. Never forget to educate yourself and be your own health advocate. Now, watch this next video right here.